So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brittany Gregory. I'm the Associate Director of Judicial and Legislative Relations for the Administrative Office of the Courts, or ALC. Thank you to everyone for joining ALC and the Department of Corrections for the webinar today. The goal is just to give everyone a refresher on how to properly complete the judgment and sentence forms. And then we'll also talk about some of the common mistakes we see in the completed forms and how we can prevent those from happening. There will also be a chance for attendees to ask questions at the end. So please save your questions to the end and then you'll be able to enter them to the chat and Haley will read those aloud for the presenters to answer. Um, so I introduced myself, but I also wanna give the other panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves, starting with Diane Ashlock. Hello everyone, I'm Diane Ashlock. I work with the Department of Corrections. I've been with the agency for my entire career and that's over 30 years. I'm currently Senior Director of Records, Hearings and Resentence. And so it's an honor to be here today and to share our information with you. So thank you for having me. Okay, uh, Barb, how about you? Uh, yes, hello everyone. My name is Barbara Serrano. I work as a Senior Policy Advisor to the Governor on Public Safety. Um, however, the reason I'm here today is I'm wearing my hat as a member of the Gender and Justice Commission, um, and uh, I'm going to talk about judgment and sentence forms, so, and I'm also a former prosecutor. Thank you. Um, and then Tina, do you want to introduce yourself? Good afternoon. I'm Tina Burgess. I work for the Department of Corrections. I'm the records manager at both our male and female reception centers. Thank you. And Christina, how about you? You're muted. You <laughs> Sorry. Christy Mueller, Director of Statewide Records, and I am responsible for oversight of the records division within the agency. Good to be here. Thank you. And then Haley. Hi, um, my name is Haley Perkins. I'm a court program analyst for the Office of Judicial and Legislative Relations at the Administrative Office of the Courts. All right, so starting us off, I want to talk a little bit about the 2021 gender bias study. Um, that study had identified some limitations regarding the data garnered from the judgment and sentence forms. And Barb Serrano, who's representing the Gender and Justice Commission, is here to discuss some recommendations to improve those limitations. Thank you. And I am going to go ahead and share my screen and go there. All right. Okay, so in 2021, the Gender and Justice Commission um, issued a major report on uh, the impact of gender, well, gender and race in the criminal justice system and civil legal system. And we um, looked at the status of what's happening in courts and in um, jails, prisons, um, every level of the court system. And the reason I'm here today is to talk about um, one of the key recommendations, which was to improve data collection. And we identified some concerns with the judgment and sentence forms and recommended, um, and I'm here today to talk a little bit about that, but to also um, make a call to action and seek your um, support in helping us gather better data um, regarding folks who go through the system. And the reason is that as I'm sure many of you would acknowledge, um, there are some systemic biases in the system with respect to everything from arrests to charges, to sentencing, to incarceration. And the only way to really identify those types of things is to have good data. Um, and we realized in the course of our research that you know, the, uh, there is a section on the forms that, um, does provide a space for folks to um, not only include their information about their date of birth, et cetera, um, aliases, but information about um, their race and ethnicity and how they identify. And this became a concern for us because this data is actually analyzed later by the Caseload Forecast Council, which then issues reports. And those reports are then provided to the legislature, which then you know, uses those reports and other information to make policy decisions. And um, one thing we noticed, um, and there's some issues with the methodology that's currently being used with the Caseload Forecast Council, that's a separate issue. But just to um, illustrate the gaps in the, in the information, 
we saw that in the case of forecast council reports that the Latino population is nearly non-existent um, as far as you know, what's being reported with respect to felony convictions. And we know that in fact, it's a pretty substantial population because if you look at the Department of Corrections data, um, Latinos comprise 16.1% of the DOC population. And that's just behind the black population, which is 17.5%. Um, I think the reason that DOC has a better um, picture of who is in the prison system is because they, receive that information upon entry. So if folks are self-identifying um, their race and ethnicity. So, um, so we're asking you know, all of you, judges, defense attorneys, prosecutors, everyone who works in the court system, court administrators and clerks to please um, really encourage folks to fill out this information so we have better um, data at the end. Um, you know, one of the issues, of course, is we we don't have a uniform court system, and so many courts have different JNS forms. Um, what one thing that we're going to maybe ask for is that at least this section of the form, the demographic information, be standardized, and we would hope that you would help us in support of that. Um, and I think that's about it. I just, if you have any questions and would like to be involved, we would um, love to hear from you. Um, and I, hold on one second, I think I've got, there is our contact information. Um, so thank you for this time and I'm going to hand it off. Thank you, Barb. Up next, we have Diane from the Department of Corrections to discuss some of the issues she's observed with the way that judgment and sentence forms are being completed and possible solutions. She'll also give us a walkthrough on how to properly complete the form. Hello, everyone. Give me a second as I navigate um, sharing. We at Department of Corrections use a different application. We use Teams. And so it always kind of catches me off guard here a little bit. Um, so it's okay. It's the great Teams versus Zoom debates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, I, um, so thank you everyone for attending today. It's an honor to be um, here and explain how DOC uses the judgment and sentence post-sentencing. And um, we're primarily gonna focus on um, prison sentences, but we will also talk about other factors as well. So this presentation was developed um, not only to be delivered here, but we are delivering it within the counties. So we've um, been to King County already and had a, pros uh, a presentation with the prosecutors in the public defender's office. Next week, we will be on the road to Yakima for an in-person um, presentation of the information. Always willing to come out or um, in person or virtually to provide um, this information. And, and we've been doing that for a number of years now. So we've already introduced ourselves. I'm Diane Ashlock. Um, Christy Mueller and Tina Burgess are on standby to assist with um, maybe the questions that come in that are more detailed so that we can give you a good response at the end of the webinar. The agenda today, I'm going to review um, Department of Corrections and what happens when someone is sentenced to a prison term. I think just having a, a good um, quick summary of the actions that DOC takes um, at that time would, is helpful. I will review the DOC time calculations and how we determine release dates and some myths around that. We'll certainly review um, judgment and sentence and the reasons why we seek clarification or corrections on the court orders. And as you all know, uh, we have resentences now really become part of our way of life. And so we are starting to see some trends on judgment and sentence documents for a resentence that we would like to share with you and then leave you with DOC contact information. And I really can appreciate uh, what Barb Barbara was speaking about, about 39 counties and multiple ways of court documents that come into DOC. And that changes over time too. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. The agency's mission statement is to improve public safety by positively changing lives. In 2016, the Records Division developed a mission statement as well. And our mission statement is to accurately apply legal court documents to establish their DOC jurisdiction for those in our care and custody and for those in the community. 
the uh, court documents are what gives DOC the jurisdiction to either confine or supervise in the community. I consider those our foundational documents for our agency. And once we have those entered in, um, everything starts. And so, um, again, our focus today is on prison sentences for time calculations. This does not diminish any of the other judgment and sentences that are completed by the court system for um, those individuals that um, maybe go to the county jail or receive a sentence alternative. It's just not going to be our focus today, uh, but we can certainly do a future presentation on impacts that we see around those judgment and sentences as well. We're focused more on the prison um, confinement judgment and sentences because they carry the most risk for the agency and um, creates our staff really want to follow the court order that has been ordered by the court. So when someone is sentenced to a prison commitment, they um, the court also will complete a warrant of commitment, transferring the custody of that individual from the county jail to the Department of Corrections. Our staff will review all of those documents um, that come in with the in incoming individual and we will identify when a correction or clarification is needed. And I have this in red because I'm going to go over some the the more common reasons why we um, write seeking clarification. DOC must follow the judgment and sentence and any subsequent court orders um, to establish our jurisdiction and for the length of the sentence. DOC is not authorized. There's court decisions that don't allow us to make changes or to interpret it differently. So we are really reliant on what we receive from the court system. Our, we have an Omni, it's our system of record that we do an entry based on the judgment and sentence in any of the following court orders. So when we receive the new prison admission, um, Barbara already spoke to this a little bit. Uh, we receive the list from the county and we prepare for the individual's arrival. We will then verify that the individual has a prison confinement term to be served at DOC. We do the interview with the individual where we collect um, personal characteristics information, um, information about um, who they are. We will also do a warrant and detainer review. And again, I have this in red because I'm going to speak a little bit more on that. Uh, we do fingerprint individuals and we um, submit that information to the state patrol about why they're in our care and custody and what for which cause. We do health assessments, classification is assigned, we assign custody levels. Um, most individuals will be um, sent to a parent facility from after receiving at either Shelton or Gig Harbor for the females. And while I'm here, I wanna just talk a little bit about warrant detainer review. And you have this handout as part of the presentation materials. So, when the individual comes into DOC, we will do a wants and warrants check through the state patrol system to see if there's any untried charges. So the goal is to resolve those untried charges for those individuals um, if they choose to do that so that they can transition to lower levels of custody and maybe even be in a reentry programs such as reentry centers or out on um, partial confinement with um, electronic home monitoring. So in some cases, the warrants do need to be resolved for the individuals to um, classify into lower levels of custody. So there was a significant change in the statute of um, in chapter 9.9A8 that governs the handling of intrastate and tried, untried indictments. So prior to um, July of 2021, the statute only applied to felony charges in Superior Court. But the change that was significant in July of 2021 was that the legislature expanded the statute to include misdemeanors, gross misdemeanors, and juvenile charges for not only Superior Court, District Court, Municipal, and Juvenile Courts. So the whole purpose of expanding that statute was to support successful reentry into the community. What DOC is starting to see as the impact is that individuals are very interested in um, transitioning down to lower levels of custody and transferring to partial confinement. So the incarcerated individuals often um, are really interested in the court's response when they ask for a speedy disposition. And they often um, repeatedly ask DOC, what's the resolution to my request? 
So DOC's actions here is when the individual arrives to DOC for a prison commitment, we'll complete the war wants and warrants check. If the warrant is identified for an untried Washington charge, DOC will notify the incarcerated individual and we provide them the forms to request a final disposition. Once those forms are completed, DOC will send those final disposition requests via certified mail to the prosecutor. DOC will then monitor for 120 days for resolution of untried charges. We will run another wants and warrants check as a follow-up to see what the status is. If there's been no action taken, we will then follow up a letter, write a follow-up letter to request action be taken within seven days. So we really ask prosecutors when you receive those certified um, requests to resolve untried charges to please act on them so that um, the individual has a resolution. Also to be aware that if you are resolving matters in court and there's district or municipal court cases that can be resolved, please do so at that time. And global resolutions, if you have a global resolution for felony charges in different counties and you wanna ensure that those warrants are resolved and canceled when you resolve the um, sentencing. One, um, there is a court decision that's relating to the state B Peeler. And this indicates that the court only has 120 days to act. And if the court does not act, then an order dismissing should be entered in. So again, this is something that incarcerated individuals are very in tune to. Um, they repeatedly ask DOC for status updates. Uh, we will be directing them back to the court or their defense attorney or the prosecutor's office um, if we're not able to help facilitate a resolution. Release planning, a release planning. Most all individuals will return to the community. So DOC starts release planning almost from day one. Uh, and it's especially important when the court has ordered a term of community custody. Um, an improved plan is required for that individual to release um, in lieu of their earn early earn time. Uh, DOC staff will complete a needs assessment to determine what resources the individual has for release and whether they qualify for let's say housing vouchers. And at time of release, DOC has statutory obligations to no notify any enrollees for victims and witnesses and for law enforcement. And so there are time limitations for those actions to be done. Release authority. So as most of you are aware, our state tends to um, have a lot of change over the years within the sentencing guidelines and the statutes. And there are two primary authorities in which individuals release from the Department of Corrections. The first and the oldest authority is the Indeterminate Sentence Review Board. And that is for individuals who committed offenses prior to July 1 of 1984. And so those are commonly referred to as um, the parole cases. The statute later was amended to include certain sex offenders, certain sex offenses committed on or after September 1 of 2001. And then it was later also amended for certain individuals who committed certain um, offenses um, prior to the 18th birthday. And so they also have a process where they can go in front of the Indeterminate Sentence Review Board for consideration of release. All other sentences, DOC is responsible for determining uh, when someone releases. And this is a lot of risk that the agency assumes to ensure that the calculations are correct, that we're not releasing anybody early or not holding anybody too long. So it's the balance of both of those um, interests of public safety and the individual's um, due process and liberty rights. So there's a lot of um, factors that play into release dates. Um, as you know, the data when the crime was a commi committed determines the earned time percentages. Some crimes have mandatory sentences and enhancements. There's jail credits uh, for a time served pre-sentence that gets factored in. And also the consecutive concurrent relationships within the counts on a judgment and sentence into other judgment and sentences. So DOC records responsibility is to calculate the sentence and determine release, date, release dates for all active judgments. So this will include a review of whether the individual was already serving a sentence and how those sentences are served in relationship to one another. How, how did the court order those sentences to be served? DOC also has the authority to modify the jail time certified so that the days being credited are, are accurate. 
And then finally, DOC assumes the risk for the sentence calculation. And our staff who do these calculations, um, this weighs heavy um, on them, and they really rely on the court documents to be clear and concise so that they can uh, perform their um, functions and do these determinations for the agency and for the individual. There are three primary release dates that DOC will calculate when someone is sentenced to a term of confinement um, to DOC. The very first one is the earned release date, and that is the estimation of the earliest date that someone will release from that sentence. Um, it's important to note on this that the behavior must be earned um, by either good behavior or programming. It can be lost by infractions or failure to program. The lost earned time can also be restored. So if they, learn, they lose earned time early on in their sentence um, confinement term, that that can be restored with positive um, and improved behavior. And in some cases, maybe um, in order to release on your earned release date, you may be required to have an approved plan to release. And again, that's connected to whether that sentence also has a term of community custody. The second important um, date that we calculate is called the maximum expiration date. We call that max X for short. And that is the final date that DOC can hold someone in DOC confinement for that sentence. And that is based on the calculation of the confinement term that was ordered without any earned time applied. The third um, date that we calculate is called the statutory maximum date. We refer to it as state, stat max. This is the jurisdiction end for that sentence for DOC based on the felony class of the convicted offense for both confinement and term of supervision. So as you know, some individuals are sentenced to their um, statutory max just based on a confinement term for such as a class C, might, they might receive 60, 60 months in confinement. Um, they may release from confinement on their statutory maximum date and have no supervision. So I'm sure some of you out there have received an email from DOC that we've identified a concern or need clarification. Um, we would appreciate um, a response back when you receive those emails. Uh, we have staff in all different levels of training and um, sometimes we make errors on our side. So if you, if, if we, are emailing you about a potential concern, but you don't believe there's a concern, please let us know so that we can take action to um, correct our record and to know that we have a response. So the top reasons why DOC writes emails. And so I thought it would be important to look at two timeframes here. So I looked from July 1 of 2018 to July 1 of 2019. So that's pre-pandemic. So that's more what our normal course of business used to look like. And then I chose July 1 of 2021 to July 1 of 2022. So that's post um, pandemic. And these are the statewide numbers. And the top concerns really are um, around community custody, whether it's eligible to be ordered for that type of conviction and the length. Confinement is another reason why we might write um, we might be seeking clarification on what the confinement length is. Jail credits is um, the next um, area that we write on for just seeking clarification because those jail credits matter on our time calculations and we want to make sure we are getting those accurately. And then clarification and other, this is just a bucket of um, other reasons why we write, um, but it's a high number that I thought I would share. Um, out of that, we had, um, for those time frames, um, this is a total identified concern. So know that there's other categories that I'm not listing here because there just wasn't enough to um, account for um, filling up the table. So as you can see, um, the trend has always been, community custody has always been the top reason why DOC writes. And I would speculate is that is because we've had so much legislative change about when you get post supervision. Um, it, it was the parole system. And then when we transitioned to Sensing Reform Act, there was no post um, supervision, um, post 
release supervision. Sorry about that. Um, and then we recognized as a state that that wasn't correct. And so we started adding um, which type of offenses we're going to have community um, placement at that time and then it morphed to community custody. So there's been a lot of evolution um, about who gets supervision for how long and what type of offenses over the um, last few years. And so it's not really a surprise to me that that's one of the reasons why we write um, consistently um, across the state. So the steps that DOC takes when we identify that there's a potential concern. So we will send an email to the court. It's usually the judge on record, um, the deputy prosecuting attorney or the prosecutor of record, um, defense counsel of record to identify the sentencing concern or need for clarification of the sentence. If there's no response received or if the court disagrees with DOC's assessment, DOC will take another look at that um, information provided back, and then we will decide whether we refer that to the Assistant Attorney General's office for action. So that's the first step that we take. The Assistant Attorney General's office will follow up with the court if they do feel that there needs to be a correction or clarification provided to DOC. They generally do their first um, reach out is informally through an email to try to seek resolution. If there's no agreement based on those discussions on what the perceived error is, then the Attorney General's Office will file a post-sentence petition on behalf of the Department of Corrections to the Court of Appeals. And what's really important, you'll see in our emails to you that when if we write to you, is that we ask for action within a certain period of time. And why that is, is because that statute um, requires that that petition be filed within 90 days of DOC's receipt of the judgment and sentence. So um, there usually is some transportation time factored in that already. Then DOC has operational time in order to review the sentence and get that entered in and identify when there's a potential error. So the time kind of ticks away pretty quickly on us and that is why we ask for responses within a very short period of time. Um, once a PSP is filed, um, indigent inmates will be assigned counsel for the rule. There are several elements on a judgment and sentence, and what I really want to focus on today are those really um, essential and critical elements to DOC. So, um, and this is broken down into three categories by individual, by cause, and by conviction. So what's really important is having the individual's name accurate. One of the things that we're seeing with name changes is that um, sometimes individuals have name changes. And so ensuring that you're using their most accurate legal name, um, their date of birth and their SID number, those are all important identifying information for DOC so that we can establish our jurisdiction. By cause, the cause number, the county date of sentence, the judge's name. Um, if you are a judge, we please ask that you um, maybe have a stamp for your um, name that goes under your signature. It is difficult to read signatures, and it is important that we enter the judge into our system. So having that date name date name stamp um, is really helpful to us. If you're going to order credits, that's very um, important and essential, and the conditions. So the date of offense, the RCW number, and the description of the offense are very important to DOC. We in our system have built a table that sits behind our calculations. And so as I uh, mentioned earlier today, the date of offense really drives um, maybe earn time percentages or whether a community custody term will be ordered. So it's just really important that that, that is accurate amongst all of the documents. Um, your information, your amended information, your plea agreements, all of those things. The RCW and the description is as important because that also drives um, some of our calculations behind the scene. We also do um, enter in the offender score, which that became very helpful in State v. Blake. We were able to provide reports to um, everyone working on those cases. The felony class is important because that, again, sets our statutory maximum length that we have jurisdiction. And any finding types, anticipatory, and enhancements, those are extremely essential um, to our calculations. Confinement length, again, essential. 
if it's an alternative sentence enhancements, supervision links, and if you're ordering any mandatories. And I'm going to break this down a little bit more. So the judgment and sentence, which are critical for sections for time calculations, there are six sections here. Uh, the ones in bold are the ones that we are, is a top reason why we write um, seeking clarification or correction. So the six um, it, critical sections are exceptional sentence, confinement over one year, enhancement terms, mandatory minimum terms, total confinement term imposed, credit for time served, and community custody. So for an exceptional sentence, this is really key to the Department of Corrections. It tells us that the court intended to sentence the individual either below or above the standard range. And so it's important that we receive that information so that we don't write a letter seeking clarification or correction. So it's important for the confinement term is it's where it's most commonly used, where you're either going to below the standard range or above for either mitigating or aggravating circumstances. It can also be used, and this is, I think, less common, um, to change the length of the community custody term. And again, it need the, that offense needs to be eligible for a term of community custody. It's only adjusting the lengths. It's not adjusting whether um, that crime is eligible for that option of community custody. The third way that we see the exceptional sentence is used is when individuals are sentenced as a special sex offender sentencing alternative and the court is ordering a condition of confinement to DOC more than 365 days. So if it's 365 days or less, the individual is serving that time at the county jail. But if it's 365 days or more, they're serving it at DOC. And that is by statute through an exceptional sentence. So confinement over one year, this is bolded because this is a reason why we write um, frequently. Our number one ask is please try to print legibly. Um, we see a lot of variation of how judgment and sentence forms are filled out. Sometimes they're typed. Um, sometimes they are um, handwritten with lots of arrows and lots of explanation. The second really critical thing for us is all of the discussions that you're having and the agreements that you're making regarding the sentence be sure to be clearly articulate that in writing on your court order. Uh, DOC wants to carry out your orders, but we're not in the courtroom to hear the discussions. So making sure that what you're agreeing to is articulated down on the judgment and sentence, clear and concisely. Ensure each count is addressed with the length in either months or days, and DOC will be looking for that. If there's guilty um, findings on the counts, we're looking for what the confinement term is on each count. Please indicate if those confinement terms for the counts are running consecutive or concurrently. And then finally, make sure that you're indicating whether this sentence as a whole is running consecutively or concurrently to a previously imposed sentence. Uh, we do note here that for sentences that are concurrent, the credits for the time served are determined independent of the other sentence. So in some cases, it may be the same credits, and in some cases, it may not be. So it's just an important note. This is one area where incarcerated individuals will write to us and ask clarification. Enhancement and mandatory minimum terms, these are um, very important because they're often adding significant amount of time to the confinement term, um, specifically deadly weapon, firearm, sexual motivation enhancements for crimes committed after June 10th of 1998 should run, shall run consecutively to each other and to the base terms within the cause and to any other cause. So it's important to include a total for the sentence and for when the enhancements run consecutive to another cause. And I have an example that I would like to show with you. So um, this is pretty typical um, judgment and sentence um, for the section of the confinement order that DOC will receive. And in this example, it is for a cause number. I didn't write the initial cause number here, but as you can see, the individual has three counts um, and there's the individual serving um, the court imposed confinement on each count. This is a really good example where the court um, 
whoever authored the document indicated that these three counts run concurrent to one another. And then they said, ordered that this cause to run concurrent to another cause. So this is the additional cause um, that is um, also was sentenced on the same day. And then this states the above term shall run consecutive to any previously imposed sentence not referred to in this order. And then this sentence imposed 60 months of firearm enhancement to run on count one. And so the individual um, did the correct math. 411 plus 60 equals 471. So that's awesome. And as you can see, they also have another total here of 531 months because in this individual sentencing, it was recognized that the 60 months being served for the firearm enhancement on the other cause number, they must run consecutively. So this was done in a way that DOC understands what the total sentence is to be served. So the author of this document did an outstanding job in DOC's view of really identifying, even though the judgment and sentence doesn't have that line to say what is the total, overall total for all sentences being served. So that's a really great example of um, someone taking the form template, understanding the statute, and clearly articulating what the intent of the court is was at that time. Ensure that the judgment and sentence has template language to order a mandatory minimum. If you if you don't have that already on there, a total confinement term imposed. This is being redundant. Check your math. Make sure that the totals match for the confinement enhancement are mandatory. We are starting to see a lot of uh, variation, and I and I think it's in response to um, the pandemic, and a lot of individuals um, have been delayed going into court for their sentencing, and so there's a lot of agreement. Not I shouldn't say a lot. That might be an over characteristic characterization, but there are times DOCs receiving information that the confinement term has been served in full. So I think some of the issue is we're still using template language on judgment sentences that really don't address uh, what the parties are trying to achieve. And so the parties can agree that the confinement term can be served in full, but what I would suggest that you do if you're doing that, that you strike this template language down here at the bottom that says in the custody of the Department of Corrections as follows. So that the standard template, when you impose a term of total confinement to the Department of Corrections, and it says commencing immediately. So it creates a contradiction if you're stating that the sentence is term, served in full but do not strike this language at the bottom. Um, DOC staff will write, we will see clarification because we wanna make sure that uh, we understand what the intentions of the court are. It's okay to say, state that the confinement term is completed in full, just make sure that you're striking this additional language. So my tip would be um, if you have that situation, really read the language on your template. I think that um, we all get really immune to our form templates and we don't really read them for every situation. But when you have a situation that's outside of the norm, please um, take the time to ensure that um, you're taking care with the form to strike out what's no longer necessary. Credit for time served. Um, this is another area where we write um, seeking clarification. So most judgment and sentence templates across the state will either have a blank for the court to indicate the number of days served, or there's a checkbox, or they'll defer to the jail to, to determine the pre-sentence days. Um, what DOC is looking at in these situations is, did the individual serve solely on this cause in an, um, to award pre-sentence credits? But we also need to know when that individual um, served solely on that cause on this cause in another jurisdiction pending extradition. So an example of this is an out-of-state apprehension on a warrant um, where they may be in that state waiting extradition. DOC would not necessarily have that information. We will always go back to the 
the jail in which that sentence is originating out of to ask for pre-sentence time. So if you are a public defender or a prosecutor and you're aware that the individual served time in another jail outside of Washington state, if you could please make a note on the judgment and sentence, and it would be helpful if you knew the name of the detaining facility and, and the city. Um, if you are going to write the number of days that DOC needs to give credit, um, please know that DOC is going to compare the credits um, with the warrant of commitment and the jail certification. We often see where there's inconsistencies between those three documents. So if your warrant of commitment is going to outline some of those um, factors from the judgment and sentence, always be sure that um, your documents are being consistent. Um, Jail good time credit is always based on the jail certification. So DOC will communicate with the jail to understand if the individual was on good behavior during their pre-sentence time. And if they were, we will award them their earned jail time credits. Um, if you are going to indicate to DOC that you want a certain number of days to be applied as credit for time served, it's the best practice would be on the in judgment and sentence to note the dates of confinement for that specified number of days. So for an example, if you want to say the individual is going to get 56 days of credit for time served, note that that is from March 17th to May 12th of 2021. That'll allow DOC to compare the documents from the judgment and sentence and the jail certification and apply the, the correct amount of pre-sentence time and also apply the correct amount of jail good time that was served solely on that charge. Community custody, again, this is in bold. I've talked about it just a little bit. Um, ask yourself, is the offense eligible for a term of community custody by looking at the statute if you need to? Um, indicate which counts have a term of community custody and the length of the term for each count. So some, some current and older versions of um, judgment and sentence forms just had one little line um, there for a community custody term. Generally, that doesn't impose um, any impact, except now that we're back in vacating counts because of um, State B. Blake and, and simple possession of controlled substances, it is having an impact. So indicating up front which counts have the term of community custody will actually be a benefit if there is an appeal on a sentence or a sentence is overturned, and then DOC understands which count has a term of community custody. And this is really important because DOC has the authority to screen for who's eligible for community custody. Not everyone um, is supervised by the Department of Corrections. So it's important for Department of Corrections to understand which term the count belongs to. Exceptional sentence may be only adjusted for the length of the term. It does not make an offense eligible for a term of community custody. And then prison doses. So for a prison dosa, um, as most of you are aware, there's two portions. There's the confinement portion and the com community custody portion. There's also in the statute, DOC has the ability to um, terminate a prison dosa and reclassify them to serve the, in, the entire confinement term. So when that happens, um, that offense may be eligible for an additional term of community custody. And so that those sentencing documents need to indicate that as well. So after the individual is received at DOC, um, the top concern that we hear from incarcerated individuals following their admission and after we do their time calculations, most will tell us, you're not calculating my time correctly. And um, we, we spend a lot of time um, trying to educate and help individuals understand how we are calculating their time. Um, we do ask that you not create an expectation of a release on a specific date. Um, DOC staff will rely on the court and jail documentations. Um, and again, those need to be clearly outlined on the documents. And there might be DOC sanctions that may impact when the subsequent sentence will start. So some individuals are currently or already under DOC jurisdiction and are having um, sanctions to um, allegations of um, conditions of supervision and that might not be known at the time of sentencing. So the top, um, that top concern about you're not collect, 
calculating my ERD correctly is really there's a myth um, out in the public and incarcerated individuals and others. So the myth is that, that DOC will take the earned time percentage and apply it to the total confinement term to determine the earned release date from total confinement. So let's say um, if the individual is sentenced to 90 months and individuals know that they're gonna get a third off their sentence, um, most people will just assume that the individual is gonna release after 60 months. But that is not the calculation that DOC um, conducts. So there is a WAC that determ that directs DOC how to calculate release dates. And for a determinate sentence, um, DOC is instructed to deduct the jail time and the jail earned release time from the total sentence. That then leaves an adjusted sentence, which DOC earned time is then applied to. And I have a little example here um, that kind of outlines the common error in calculating and the calculating per WAC. So what DOC will do when we, um, we do this within our system, and we also have Excel spreadsheets that we do a secondary check to ensure that we've got our calculations correct. But the first step we do is we take the, the months and convert it to days. So in this situation, 90 months was converted to 2,738 days, um, and that's would be on both. DOC will then apply the pre-sentence credits and the jail good time credits. And for this individual, it was 328. We then subtract that from 2,738 to get 2,410. That would be the days serving to be served at DOC. So DOC will then apply 33 and a third percent um, as earned time and determine that based on 2,410, the individual has the potential to earn 804 earn time days with DOC. Then you would subtract that um, from the 2410 to get 1606. The 1606 is the number of days that the individual would have to serve at DOC from the date of arrival at DOC to get to calculate their earn release date. So, and you see in this example, DOC's earn release date is going to be later than the individual who's just calculating a third off of 60 months. So this is something we do a lot of education on uh, with incarcerated individuals. Um, it's not an easy concept for most to understand. Another thing that we're seeing a lot of, um, and I think it's primarily because of the pandemic, a lot of individuals are serving uh, pre-sentence time before they um, are um, have that opportunity to have their sentence completed in court. So there are um, times that DOC will get the request that we really believe this confinement term is satisfied. Um, DOC does not estimate any release dates pre-sentence. We will, with sentencing documents, post-sentence or revoke, upon request, DOC can review the sentence and provide estimated release dates. It's really important to note that if community custody is also ordered on that judgment and sentence, a transport still may be needed to DOC because DOC doesn't have the authority to release until we have an approved plan because they're releasing in lieu of earned early release time. If the individual has not been ordered a term of committee custody, then um, they may be able to be released from the jail. Uh, DOC will certainly be happy to do those calculations and we will notify the jail if the individual is eligible to be released. So for a new sentence, we ask that the filed sentencing documents um, be sent in the jail certification be sent to our records unit at WCC in Shelton. And for residential DOSA revokes, those documents can be sent to our DOC revoke and return unit. We ask that if you, you use this option, please um, have a pretty good idea that the individual sentence has been served. Um, it is a resource that um, will take away from entering the other incoming sentences. Okay, so that was just on your initial sentence, um, things that we're looking for. So I'm going to transition now to our more current work of resentence. So preparation for a resentence, there's lots of different ways and reasons why individuals are being 
are being resentenced in today's world. It can be State v. Blake. It could be uh, for youthful uh, mitigating qualities that need to be considered uh, for individuals under the age of 20 when they committed their offense. Um, and there might be other ways, uh, persistent um, robbery too, and there's a whole slew of court decisions and legislation that may be a pathway for a resentence. So in one of the first things, attorneys are going to be preparing for that resentence, and they may want DOC records or documents, um, and those can be requested to DOC through a portal, which I've included the link here. This is a portal that attorneys will use. Please indicate when you need the information and those requests are being expedited. So it's a public records request, but they are being expedited to help assist you in evaluating your case for resentence. There's also information that DOC can just provide by email, and that might be just information about are there other sentences being served? How are those being served? Can you give me current release dates? Can you tell me about their earned time losses? Or a um, really common one is information about whether this person was on community supervision at the time they committed the offense for the uh, convictions that are being resentenced. Those email requests can be sent to DOC resentencing and they will respond. In some of situations, individuals, the attorneys might know that the individual is going to become an immediate release after resentence. This is really important that an email notification be sent to DOC once you have any indicator that the person is going to be an immediate release. Some individuals are serving really super long sentences. Some are life without. Some are just weren't planning on releasing. And so DOC would like to be notified so that we can start asking those um, questions of the incarcerated individual. What are your uh reentry re resources, what do you need, so that we can start doing planning and preparing them for release to the community. This is a, some, for some individuals, it's a, um, it's a, a great thing to be released, but some of them haven't been preparing for their release either. Um, whoops. Consideration for any resentence. So, um, Please reconcile the original judgment sentence to the resentence judgment and sentence. Ensure all counts are being addressed. Uh, this is that point about which counts should have a term of community custody. So this would be your opportunity if the prior court order did not specify which count the community custody term was ordered for to clarify. Um, you could certainly clarify on the resentence document. Um, are other sentences being served? consecutive um, to this sentence. And why that's um, important to understand is so that you have an idea of how the time calculations will relate to each other um, after this individual's resentenced. And then asking, does a mandatory minimum apply? Um, if it's silent J, uh, on the judgment sentence, DOC will follow the statute. And with some of these resentencing, the, the courts have the discretion to not apply a mandatory minimum. Considerations for a Blake resentence. Um, we ask that um, you vacate all of the simple possession causes at one time. Um, DOC, when we receive a vacate order, um, we will go in and vacate that on the individual's criminal history that we report to the state patrol. So that then helps clean up that record on, on DOC's end with the state patrol, but it also will impact whether the individual um, may or may not be supervised by DOC. So our criminal history section does drive a portion of our risk level classification, which the risk level classification is also a factor in some cases about determining whether someone will be on supervision or not. So when they have, um, simple position, possession uh, convictions that are being vacated. Um, DOC would love to have all of those vacates for that individual by county. Um, right now they're, they're trickling in, but what's required is DOC has to go into the record each time we receive one. And it also impacts the individual differently or may impact the individual differently. So the example of committee custody that I was speaking to, this is an example where the original order had two counts and the community custody term was just 12 months. It didn't associate that 12 month term to either count. 
in most situations, it, it doesn't have an impact, but it became an impact when the possession of a controlled substance was vacated because attempting to elude a pursuing police vehicle is not a, a conviction that's eligible for a term of community custody. So in this instance, DOC needs to still apply the 12 months to the count one because we don't have direction to do anything differently. So there is recommended language that you could clarify that you're striking the community custody from this judgment as a result of count two being dismissed and vacated and the remaining felony count um, is not eligible for community custody, or you can just simply say no community custody on this cause. Uh, court orders. This is an example of um, some of the work that our record staff do to um, ensure that we're understanding the court order. And a lot of our staff refer to it. It's like doing a puzzle. There's lots of pieces of um, things that we look at. We're looking for consistency and clarification. So this was an individual that was resentenced. And um, as you can see, this, this is an example where there's um, a lot of scratch outs, arrows. Um, there's some good things and some things that I wish were, were done differently on this particular court order. Um, up here at the top on count one, it's it just, it, there's no numerical value for the length of confinement. It's credit for time served as determined by DOC. DOC doesn't know what this means. There's no dates. There's no, um, we're not really sure what's meant by that statement. Um, count two does a, a nice job, says 99, 99 months. And then this is great. It says counts one and two are to be concurrent to one another. Um, the this handwritten section here with the X in the box with the X, the court deems that this individual's sentence is satisfied. And then the court, uh, the, the second add-in box, the court is exercising discretion to impose no additional time on the two fire enhan firearm enhancements. This is excellent language handwritten in. It really clearly tells DOC that the court intended not to impose the firearm enhancements. Um, and then down here at the bottom, the total for all imposed um, confinement term is credit for time served as determined by DOC. DOC staff felt this was really contradictory to the sentence being satisfied. Um, we continued to look through the documents and here the findings of fact and conclusion indicated that um, count one um, has already been served approximately 16.7 years and then um, 99 months for count two. We continue to look at the clerk's minutes. Uh, we do go into the clerk's um, information to see how they have entered sentences as well. And um, they indicate that the sentence was deemed as satisfied and indicated 16.7 years instead of the credit for time served. So that, that's just an example of the work that staff do to try to understand um, what occurred in court and maybe offer some suggestions on um, how to do that differently, maybe just indicating 16.7 years instead of um, credit for time served. Um, important resentence documentation for DOC, this will appear to be a little bit redundant. Make sure you impose a confinement term per count with an overall total. Mandatory minimums and enhancements in certain resentencing, the court does have um, discretion to exercise. And so please indicate if you're not imposing. Um, if concurrent consecutive, include when you want that sentence to start. If it's being changed from it once was consecutive to now you're going to run those sentences concurrently, tell us when you want that sentence to start so that we know. Consider not writing credit for time served. Um, it would be better to say that the jail will calculate the time that the individual served in their custody on this matter, and that the Department of Corrections shall calculate the time that the individual served in their custody prior to the date of the judgment and sentence. That gives both the jail and DOC the authority to calculate time served on the sentence. Um, state when the next confinement term is to begin. Again, if um, you want to be really specific when the next sentence is going to be starting. Um, if the intent is that the sentence is served in full, you can just state that. 
and state that the individual is to be released. So here is a resentence example with in a judgment and sentence on multiple counts. This is an awesome, excellent example. There's two counts, um, 67 months on count one, 51 on count two. It then provides a total of 118 months. And so um, that then is an indicator to our staff to understand the intent of the court. It says consecutive and it adds up. Um, I we do see a lot of math errors, which then raises the doubt of what we're trying to do with the sentence post-conviction. Court orders what to avoid. So early on in the resentencing, we're, I don't think we're seeing it as much anymore, but um, the courts were wanting to vacate the sentence while the individual was confined at DOC. Um, what the impact is here is that if there are no other sentences being served, DOC has no authority to confine. So remember the judgment and sentence that's imposed by the court gives DOC the authority to have um, to, to, to confine individuals or supervise individuals. Once those sentences are vacated, DOC has to release the individual. So um, I think I think this one is has been probably addressed. Also, um, in court orders, particularly in resentencing, the parties are seeing in some situations that individuals have served more time in confinement, and they want to give that individual that credit to their community custody term. There is a um, court um, decision, State v. Jones, that specifically states that excess credit for confinement time cannot be applied to community custody terms. Amended judgment and sentences, um, this quite frankly is the easiest way for DOC to adjust a length of confinement term for someone who's being resentenced. If the, re the confinement term is just being reduced down, DOC will then uh, enter that new value in our system and it will automatically do the calculations for us. Um, so that is um, the easiest way when we are um, receiving information on a reduced confinement term or an amended confinement term. It's more complicated if the court vacates the judgment and sentence. If, if the court um, vacates um, the judgment and sentence, again, if no other sentence is being served, the individual will have to release that individual. Um, when the new sentence comes in after a vacate, it creates a new time start with DOC on the recent. So it becomes its own standalone judgment and sentence. So in that situation, the court needs to be really specific and clarify the credits that need to be applied to that sentence. Um, so if it's the court's intent that the individual receive credit for all time served on the matter, then please tell DOC that um, so that we can give that individual the credit. Um, there are situations where the individual sentence is vacated and the individual's released from DOC and transferred to the county jail. There is some impact to that. The individual's personal property is returned, um, their money and trust accounts are released, and they must um, repurchase their hygiene items and hobby items if they come back to DOC again on that sentence. So I know that this is... Um, uh, used frequently for the more complex cases when there's victims and um, you're basically going back through another sentencing um, hearing. So just, just wanted to share what that impact is. Um, I know that there's probably situations where it cannot be avoided, um, but if you can have a virtual hearing, we do really stress virtual hearings for a number of reasons if you're able to accommodate that with the resentence um, matter that you're dealing with. So preparing for release, uh, DOC will be looking to see if a term of community custody is ordered. Um, if it's ordered, uh, the individual is required to have an improved release plan to release in lieu of earned release time. If they're unable to have an approved address, they then release on their maximum expiration date. If there is no term of community custody, the individual will release on their earned release date. DOC does have statutory authority to um, provide up to 10 days early release from ERD. And so some individuals will actually release before their earned release date if they qualify with policy on that criteria. 
We do do notifications again for victim witness and law enforcement. DOC is still looking at civil commitment in particular cases for either mental health restorations or sexual violent predator um, referrals. And there is a pretty substantial health services transition for individuals who are resentenced. They are provided medication equipment and they are enrolled for um, Medicaid prior to release. So contact information, um, you can contact me for maybe requests for um, presentations on impacts to judgment and sentences to DOC and the courts. Whoops, sorry about that. Resentence um, questions can go directly to the resentencing email box. If you have just general questions about time calculations um, post-sentence, that can go to the DOC calculations box. Uh, we do have an updated court orders um, email box. So we ask everyone, once you have a new DOC, or excuse me, new judgment sentence, to send that to the amended orders. Or if you're clarifying a current order, it's really important that DOC gets that work so that we can update our records and update the sentence calculation. This is if you believe that the term um, of confinement has been served at the time of sentencing or revoke. This is just a repeat of who to send those documents to. Um, you can send it to WCC records for a new sentence and for an individual who has had a residential dose of revoke, you can send it to our revoke and return unit. And again, please only request these if you believe that the term has been satisfied. And I'm going to take a break from talking and I'm going to show you a video that DOC has prepared to explain time calculations. And before I hit play, I, I do want to say there is music um, attached to it. The music isn't intended to be offensive, but I know I have received some feedback from um, groups that they do find the music a bit offensive for the seriousness of the matter. That's not DOC's intention. I think it's the intention is just not to have a silent um, presentation here. So with that, I'm gonna hit play.
Hopefully, we have demonstrated that the calculations are not so simple, and there are many factors that contribute to a release date. To do this work, it takes knowledge of the statutes, court decisions, and agency policies and processes. The judgment and sentence reflects the individual's convictions and sentence, which is unique to them as it relates to their date of offense. Some sentences may have similar elements, but none are the same. Thank you for watching a high-level summary of DOC time calculations, and we invite you to learn more. So, um, the other document that is in your handout, I wanted to take some of those essential and critical elements from a judgment and sentence that DOC relies upon to do time calculations and made a one pager. Um, I, we felt like maybe this could be used um, in the courtroom or at your desk when you're preparing these documents for um, sentencing, which ultimately DOC will be using. So um, again, th these are just elements from the PowerPoint focusing in on the original judgment and sentence, what are those essential and critical elements, amended judgment and sentence for resentencing, what are those, again, those essential and critical elements, please refer back up to the top blue box um, with additional information, and then for a new judgment and sentence following a vacate order, um, again, for a resentence, um, there's very distinct differences in how DOC will operationalize the judgment and sentence uh, for a resentence. So um, just understanding those um, key differences, um, I think are important. And with that said, DOC is more than um, willing to come out and maybe do um, a deeper um, presentation on any of the topics. Credits is one that is um, really, um, there's a lot of nuances to how we up credits. And, and today you just received a really high level um, or in, uh, review of that. So with that, I will turn it over and see if there's any questions that are coming in. We've answered a lot of the questions in the chat as they've been coming up, thanks to <laughs> Tina and Christina and Barb. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Please feel free to enter them into the chat. All right, we have one from Sarah. Haley, are you going to be reading them out or do you want me to read them out? I can read them. Okay. Um, so Sarah's asking, have there been counties that have successfully included gross misdemeanors and misdemeanor conviction dispositions within the felony AOC judgment and sentence documents? Currently, Pierce County, I, I believe that's the jurisdiction she's from. Um, enters two separate JNS documents, one for the felony convictions and one for the gross misdemeanor and misdemeanor convictions. I am going to ask Tina to take that one. She sees a lot of the incoming work at the facilities. I, I would love to say successfully that it happens. Um, it does happen that they, at, they put them on one judgment and sentence. However, the main problem is, is that like if they run a misdemeanor consecutive to a felony, they don't understand how the credits don't apply to both. So they'll apply the, the credits to both the felony and the misdemeanor, but they order the, the counts to run consecutive to each other. Um, but they do use the same forms through AOC. Thank you. Are there any other questions? You were so thorough, Diane, that <laughs> Well, or you it's lunchtime. <laughs> everyone needs to get back to other agendas. But uh, please reach out to DOC if you would like us to expand on other topics. Um, if there's um, topics that are like particular to your county that you would like a little bit more information on, for example, the question that just came up, if we have a little bit more time, we could probably research and maybe if you're asking how DOC would recommend to see those kind of um, combined um, sentences, then maybe we could provide some feedback really specific to the forms that you're using. So I, I think our goal is the same. We wanna carry out the sentence that the court's imposing. It's just that, um, 
everyone has a different swim lane when we're filling out those forms and how we look at them um, after sentencing. So we are certainly uh, willing to have um, those discussions and work collaboratively so that we get the best outcome for the incarcerated individual. Well, thank you to everyone for attending the webinar today. Haley has shared all the presentation materials in the chat. She sent them out several times before the webinar as well. And the webinar has been recorded. So if you would like a copy of the recording, please feel free to reach out to myself or Haley. All right. Now I'll let everyone get back to their afternoon. Thank you so much.